Greetings from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And welcome to our latest program in our continuing series. Uh, today, we will have the latest in our series of virtual curator spotlights. And today, it is uh, focused on a new exhibit. So unless you were here earlier today, you haven't seen this. And you probably don't know too much about it, although we did send a press release out uh, just the other day. It is called, Is This Heaven? And it is about the 1989 film, which has really become an important part of American popular culture, Field of Dreams, starring Kevin Costner, Amy Madigan, James Earl Jones, uh, the late Burt Lancaster, Dwyer Brown, our friend who was with us last week for the virtual author series, and uh, many other uh, key actors performing in this. Joining us today to talk about the exhibit, Is This Heaven?, uh, is Gabrielle Augustine, one of our Hall of Fame curators. Gabrielle joining us now for the third time on this program. Uh, previously, she did a program with us about the uh, Diamond Dreams, Women in Baseball exhibits. Also, our, um, uh, well, it wasn't so much about Jackie Robinson and exhibit, because we don't have an exhibit just focused on Jackie, but he is certainly a big part of our um, pride and passion, our uh, African-American baseball experience a big part of the plaque gallery as well. And we talked about that uh, as part of a uh, celebration of Jackie Robinson back in April. April, uh, Gabriel, uh, Gabrielle, thank you again for joining us. Uh, welcome back to the program. And oh, today we'll you. have some fun with baseball and film. How have you been doing? I'm doing great, I'm doing great. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to go back to the office and actually see the exhibit uh, up and final. It's been a few months of work put into this, so it's going to be awesome to see the finished product. Now, you are the lead curator on this. The other yes. curators have all contributed, but you've sort of been the driving force. So I imagine you've been putting in uh, lots of hours, both home and here at the museum. Uh, yep, uh, with uh, a lot of here at home working on the exhibit for sure. Uh, in, the, in the office when uh, time allows uh, with the variations of restrictions that we've been uh, got going on with that so uh but yeah i've been living and breathing field of dreams for a number of months now <laughs> well let's start with kind of a basic question why create the exhibit at this time uh it's a film that came out many years ago 31 years yeah so why a particular celebration here in 2020 well, uh, as many people probably know, uh, Major League Baseball decided that they were going to hold uh, a game at the Field of Dreams site. Not the exact field, uh, but actually they were building a stadium basically down the road on the same property as the site. Um, and that was really the driving force of, well, I mean, MLB is celebrating this. This is a really good way to celebrate this iconic baseball movie. Uh, even if you haven't seen it, you know the phrase, if you build it, he will come. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's really become this part of American popular culture. And so was, we thought this was a really good opportunity to uh, go and explore that. Um, of course, the game got canceled due to the pandemic, uh, but we'll look forward to seeing that game played next year. And there was never any thought of not having the exhibit. I mean, that's been no. the ahead from day one. Yes, yeah. Some of the artifacts that we're going to talk about in this exhibit are permanent parts of the museum's collection. Uh, several, though, have also been loaned to us by two very generous people. We have to mention them at least once, if not more. Uh, they are Becky and Don Lansing. They are a couple that uh, used to own the Dyersville, Iowa property and the house featured in the film. And I know, Gabrielle, you have mentioned that they have been extremely helpful to you in putting this together. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they really have lived and breathed Field of Dreams since it was filmed there. Uh, uh, Don was the owner of the property and that they, they used to, uh, to film the, the movie on. And then after the filming wrapped, uh, Don kept the property, kept the baseball field, and it became a tourist attraction uh, that now hundreds of thousands of people flock to every year much like the Hall of Fame in some respects. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so they were, they were instrumental in learning more about the behind the scenes of the film. They were uh, fantastically generous. We actually have uh, two pieces in the exhibit uh, that they have loaned to us 
from their collection of Field of Dreams uh, memorabilia and artifacts. So it was very exciting. It was great to work with them. Obviously, it was all virtual since I couldn't exactly go to Iowa and visit them. Uh, but uh, they were actually supposed to be part of the program today. But uh, with uh, the massive storms that went through Iowa earlier this week, they are without internet. So sadly, they were not able to join us today, but hopefully for another program. You guys do. They did sell the property in the house a little bit less than 10 years ago, but they still live in that area near Dyersville, Iowa. And it's still an important part of their, their memories and their lives as well. And yep. hopefully at some point we'll uh, be able to have Becky and Don on to talk more uh, about it since they've been such an important part of it uh, firsthand for so many years. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at some of the artifacts that are featured uh, in this new exhibit. I wanted to begin with this one. This is the actual screenplay for Field of Dreams um, written by the director. He both wrote it, directed it. Tell us a little bit more about this, Gabrielle. Yeah, so this is actually one of the uh, pieces that we've uh, borrowed or loaned from Becky and Don. Uh, this is probably, according to Becky, one of their most treasured possessions um, because this is a copy of the screenplay written by uh, Phil Alden Robert Robinson. Um, and then uh, it was actually signed by the cast and crew uh, and given to Don Lansing as, a thank, as part of his thank you for their use of his property. Um, so it's really, really cool to uh, see all the notes that were written to him about, you know, thanking him for the beautiful use of the property and, you know, all the time that they spent in Iowa. Um, so, yeah, so we've, uh, uh, we, we do have a copy of the screenplay in our collection, but this one takes the cake because of all the, the story behind it. You know, I was looking at it earlier. Not only is it signed by cast members, but also signed by some other folks as well. It's quite a collection of autographs. It is. It is. Um, it even includes uh, Rod Dado, who uh, was the baseball consultant for all the players on the film. So he's on there as well. Yes, legendary college baseball coach. Yep. Yeah, really. uh, let's um, let's talk about really the three main players, key actors in this. Uh, seminal film, film that we're still talking about all these years later. Um, we have uh, Kevin Costner in the middle of this photograph. Uh, he plays the central figure of Ray Kinsella. On his right, we have Amy Madigan, um, the wife of Ray, Annie Kinsella. And then on the far left, uh, longtime actor, James Earl Jones, and he portrays a mythical character, but a character that I guess is based loosely on a real life character. Uh, in the movie, he is known as Terrence Mann, very controversial author, uh, who prompts an interesting reaction in Iowa. And that's part of the plot. But for those who have not seen the movie in a while, and I guess I'm one of those, because it's been a while since I've seen the film start to finish. But if you would, Gabrielle, give us a summary of the plot, the basic parts to this movie. Sure. Um, well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of facets to this film, um, but the boiling it down uh, in a few words is that uh, Ray and Annie Kinsella are farm owners in Iowa. Uh, they own a lot of corn land, um, and that's what, that's what they make their living on. Uh, one day while Ray is out in his cornfield, he, a voice speaks to him, a mysterious voice. No one ever knows who or what this voice is. Uh, and he believes it tells him to, in essence, build a baseball field in the middle of his cornfield. Uh, and so despite, uh, you know, taunts of lunacy uh, from his other local townspeople, uh, he builds this, builds this baseball diamond. Uh, Annie is supportive all the way through this. Um, and out, out of the cornfield appears Shoeless Joe Jackson and the rest of the eight men out in the 1919 Black Sox scandal. Um, it doesn't stop there. Uh, it goes, uh, it continues on. Ray gets, the voice speaks to him again, and uh, it tells him to go visit this author uh, and bring him to Iowa to show him, to re reintroduce him to the love of baseball because uh, Terrence Mann apparently really loved, that this character really loved baseball when he was younger, but then uh, fell out of love with it. And so, uh, Ray was believed the voice was telling him to bring him back to Iowa. Uh, and then along the way, they learn about uh, Archie, Archibald Moonlight Graham, who uh, 
who never got a, his chance to have an at-bat in the major leagues, even though he did play uh, if for part of the game for the New York Giants. And so they also bring a young Moonlight Graham back to the field to get his chance to play baseball. Uh, in summation, this, 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 this movie is about uh, second chances uh, and reconnecting through baseball. So, uh, of course, that then leads to the pivotal moment for uh, those who haven't seen it and are watching. I'm sorry that this is a spoiler, but Ray Kinsella gets to reconnect to his with his father who has since died. Uh, and so it was actually one of the players who were, was able to play on the ball field and they actually get to have their uh, game of catch at the end of the movie. His I think I covered it all. <laughs> There's a lot of aspects to this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, summed it up very well. Uh, the father of Ray Kinsella, played by Dwyer Brown, who was our guest uh, about a week and a half ago talking about his book, uh, If You Build It. And we had a really good time talking to Dwyer on our virtual author series. This voice that Ray Kinsella hears, uh, I guess we don't really know if it's a ghost or some other kind of entity. Uh, it obviously is a supernatural force of some kind. Yep. And as I remember it, Ray is the only one who hears the voice. No one else does, right? Uh, actually, James Earl Jones, uh, Terrence Mann, actually hears it. They go to a baseball game in Boston. And uh, that's when the voice speaks for the third and final time. Um, and to, uh, the phrase is, go the distance. And uh, uh, Terrence Mann hears it too. And that's when he believes Ray Kinsella. And that's when they go to Minnesota to look up and find out more about Moonlight Graham. Back in 2004, James Earl Jones actually came to the Hall of Fame to do a program. Uh, he talked about Field of Dreams. He was interviewed by Jeffrey Lyons, noted film critic, in our Grandstand Theater. It was a real thrill for me, a, a great gentleman, a tremendous actor, uh, has done so many good things during a, a prolific career. His character is, is especially interesting. He's this, this author whose work is so controversial that people want to burn his books. Um, but he ends up having a softer side as well. Yes, yes. Um, actually, uh, in the book, so the movie is actually based on a book called Shoeless Joe by W.P. Kinsella. Uh, and so in the book, the author character in that book is actually J.D. Salinger, who is a real life author, uh, who has also had controversial works, things like that. Um, so that's what this, this Terrence Mann character is uh, loosely based on. And yeah, there, it's, uh, it's interesting that there's this uh, a, a PTA uh, meeting uh, in the movie where uh, both uh, Ray and Annie get up and speak a, about the love of Terrence Mann and uh, when the rest of the town is absolutely gassed by it. So it, it really does, yeah, feature it all tie together. Let's, um, let's talk about another very important player in this film. While the movie is obviously mostly mythical, uh, in terms of voices, players coming back from the past, uh, lots of supernatural things happening throughout the film. It does feature some real life elements, real life characters. One of those characters you referenced a few moments ago, and that is Archibald Moonlight Graham, uh, a guy who played in one major league game. He came in to play right field in the ninth mm -hmm. inning. And because his team was ahead and won the game, he never got a chance to bat in the bottom half of the ninth inning. And as it turned out, he never appeared in another major league game. So here we see the elderly Moonlight Graham played by legendary actor Burt Lancaster. This was actually his last feature film appearance. He did a few TV movies after this, but this was in terms of a feature theatrical release, this was the last one Lancaster ever did. Um, and it's interesting how he fits in the story. He doesn't really have a real life connection to the Black Sox, but it all somehow comes together. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the, the whole point of uh, Moonlight Graham showing up is that he, because he never got a, his chance for his at bat, basically uh, they, with both uh, Terrence Mann and Ray Kinsella, uh, bring a younger version of Archie Graham. Uh, back to the field to get his chance um, at an at, at bat, uh, and the younger version was played by uh, Frank Whaley. Um, yeah, and so with Moonlight Graham actually did only play one game, and only you know uh, it was in 1905, unlike 1922, which is what the movie says. Um, but 
uh, he did after he retired from baseball. He went on to become a doctor, like the the uh, the film does say. Um, he lived in Minnesota, um, and I think uh, in doing the research and one of the articles I read, the uh, one you know Graham eventually died. Uh, they actually read his real obituary in the movie, uh, is what they what was actually uh, what was actually written about him in real life as a, such a good doctor. Um, so yeah, he did he did go from being a ball player to becoming a beloved town doctor, um, and that's what, who Burt Lancaster is portraying. And in the film, he's probably the most heroic character because he saved somebody's life. Yep, he saves uh, Ray's daughter's life. Played by Gabby Hoffman. Yep, who was uh, end up choking on a snack, I believe, something like that. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how you have a veteran actor like a Burt Lancaster near the end of his career. Kevin Costner was just starting to become famous mm -hmm. uh, because Bull Durham had just appeared in theaters, and that yep. was creating a sensation while they were filming this. And then this movie, Field of Dreams, comes out a year after Bull Durham, so. Costner's career is really jumping off. James Earl Jones, already an established actor, yeah. and like Costner, um, has appeared in a number of baseball films. Uh, James Earl Jones was uh, in a movie, The Bingo Long All-Stars, um, about the Negro Leagues back in the 1970s. And then in the early 90s, he would do one of my favorite films, uh, The Sandlot, as well. Now, another key player that we have not mentioned yet, another longtime actor, and he was relatively young at this point, Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta plays the character of Shoeless Joe Jackson. In the film, uh, Gabrielle, what exactly is the connection between Shoeless Joe and the character of Ray Kinsella? Yeah, so uh, Shoeless Joe is actually Ray Kinsella's father's favorite character. He always, uh, Ray's father always believed that uh, Joe Jackson was innocent in the Black Sox scandal uh, and did not appreciate uh, that uh, Shoeless Joe ha got a lifetime ban from playing baseball. So when uh, Ray Kinsella hears the voice uh, to build it, he believes he's building this baseball field. He originally believes he's building this baseball field for Shoeless Joe Jackson to come back and play and get another chance at playing ball. Uh, so that, that he is the first to appear from the corn. And he does appear, as you say. I guess I, whenever I see Ray Liotta, I always think of Goodfellas. <laughs> <laughs> a completely different character. Uh, completely not different. Pathetic as Shoeless Joe in this film, but he, do, he does a very fine job. It's a relatively short appearance for him, mm -hmm. um, but a critical appearance, just like Dwyer Brown's appearance as Correct. Ray Kinsella's uh, father. Yep. Uh, so that's kind of a look at the actors and the key players in the film. Let's get into some of the artifacts. Uh, that are featured. And by the way, many of the photos that we're showing you, in fact, all the photos we're showing you, these are images that you can see in the exhibit, which did open up earlier today. Let's talk now about some of these artifacts. First one up is this Chicago White Sox cap. Um, I guess we don't know exactly who wore it, but still a key artifact from the film. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a prop cap. So let me clear that up. It is not one from uh, 1919 but it is a prop cap that was used in the film. Um, and it was used by, it was worn by one of the uh, White Sox extras. Uh, the film credits, I think, besides Shoeless Joe, uh, I think it credits four other uh, White Sox pl players. And I believe it's those who had lines, but there are still, you know, four other guys uh, who did not have lines, who were not uh, credited as a character or as a specific uh, player. Um, and so, yeah, so I actually, uh, in, in my doing my due diligence for this exhibit, uh, I was uh, working on tracking it down to make sure that this cap actually was worn in the film because, you know, films, you know, create tons and tons of costumes, tons of doubles of costumes. So I was trying to make sure and see if this was actually, actually worn. Um, it became pretty clear uh, that it was not worn by any of the, uh, by Shoeless Joe, by Ray Liotta, um, or any of the other uh, speaking parts of the White Sox players. But I did, I watched the film so many times, tracking down the specific parts with the White Sox players uh, to try and find uh, who was actually, with this cap was actually worn. And the great part uh, about, you know, doing research on uniforms, uh, pinstripes are fabulous when it comes to uniform research because they're very unique. Mm -hmm. uh, they're cut, you know, not 
they don't always match up. Uh, so looking at, you know, the, you see uh, in center front there that the pinstripes come together at a rather sharp point, which yeah. is pretty, so looking at that, um, and I was able to find and match it. It was worn by Flair in a scene right after Archie Graham gets his plate appearance. Uh, when he goes back to sit on the bench, there's a, a White Sox player sitting next to him, I think congratulates him uh, on a job well done. And uh, yes, that, that player was wearing this cap. So we do have this in the, in the collection. Uh, it was originally living uh, in baseball or baseball at the movies exhibit. And that uh, right next door to Field of Dreams. Uh, or the, is this heaven? And uh, we also have the jersey that was worn by that same player. And so that one's still in the baseball at the movies exhibit. This cap has just moved over to Field of Dreams for now. Gabrielle, I wanted to ask you what about what appears to be like a blue mark or a blue yep. horizontal line mm -hmm. on the left side of the cap. Yes. Two more question. Uh, what exactly is that? And did that help you in identifying that, yeah, this cap was used? Yep. Uh, uh, and one part question, one part one. I don't know what exactly what marking it is. I don't know if there's something they use to age, make the fabric look aged. Um, but uh, yes, it did actually, you can tell in that, that shot, there are blue marks on that cap that the player wore. And so that definitely, besides the pinstripes, the, the, the pinstripes and then that blue mark just really sealed the deal for me that that was the cap. I'm glad you said that because I've been having problems with my eyes. I'm overdue for an eye examination. I thought I was imagining the blue mark, but I'm, I'm glad that you confirmed that. Nope, uh, nope. Yeah. Um, and this is this is a permanent part of the collection. This is not one of the loaned items, correct? It's a, uh, per, a basically on permanent loan from a uh, the sports uh, studio that make the costumes for the for the movie. Uh, we yeah. have several long term loans from this company. It's I'm sure for tax reasons, et cetera, that they cannot create it into a donation at this point. But uh, yeah, it's in, in essence, it's been here since for over 20 years. So. And although it's a movie prop, it is pretty accurate to the White Sox cap style of that era, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, costumers do their research and do a pretty good job at that. So that's pretty awesome. All right. Another interesting item here is the ticket to the last shot. It's not a reference to anything in basketball. This is something completely different. We actually did talk to Dwyer Brown a little bit about this last week. This has to do with the final images in the film, the parade of cars. Tell us a little bit more about this ticket and its significance. Yeah, so this is uh, the other loan that uh, Becky and Don have generously let us uh, borrow. And uh, this is for the last shot of the movie right after uh, Ray and his dad have their, you know, their catch, the game of catch. Um, you see the camera pin up from the field and out and over Iowa, as it were, and you can see cars starting to come in and see the field. You know, at uh, Terrence Mann's, James, you know, James Earl Jones's character had this whole uh, monologue about how people will come to the field. It doesn't matter that at the moment his family's going broke because Ray's been focusing on this baseball field and not his farming. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so there's, there's just a line of cars coming. And so this is from behind the scenes. This is a ticket to be a part of that final shot. Mm. Uh, it took about 3000 Iowans, uh, and about 1500 cars to accomplish this. Um, and so, uh, I, I believe you said that Dwyer Brown said it, this, they did the shot in three days. So they had to do three different times of this, that people would just line up in cars. Uh, they got special, per the, the film production got special permission to get uh, Dyersville to black out completely. Like the power was completely cut so that there was no uh, surrounding lights. All you saw were the car lights coming. Um, and I believe in another fun fact from the scenes that there were actually instructions that were being played over the radio that all these people in these cars, they're supposed to flash their high beams uh, mm -hmm. intervals to make it look like the cars were actually moving. So it's just really cool in that this is a behind the scene piece piece of the film. Uh, Gabrielle, some people might be wondering, it says the movie Shoeless Joe, mm -hmm. not Field of Dreams. Why is that? Right. It, it, the working title for the movie was Shoeless Joe. There, it's all through production. Uh, it just, uh, to studio execs and test audiences, the, the name didn't sit right with them. It, to them, implied uh, a hobo, I believe. 
uh, was one of the quotes that I read. Uh, so uh, what and Phil Alden Robinson, who wrote the screenplay, really liked the title and really wanted to keep it. But uh, W.P. Kinsella was okay with the title changing because he was originally, when he was looking at naming his book, he had originally thought of the Dream Field as the t book title. So instead, it got flipped around and became Field of Dreams. And that's how we know it today. Yeah. You know, you wonder about the legacy of the film if it had been called Shoeless Joe. Would that have mattered? I mean, it's only speculation on our part. Uh, I don't know. I think Field I, I of think Dreams somehow have... worked perfectly. Yeah, I, I don't know. The um, Field of Dreams is, is, is part of our vernacular now, 30 yeah. years later. It's, it, I don't think Shoeless Joe would be as prominent per se. The, the quotes and the, the storyline might be, but I don't think the title would be. Very cool item. Uh, this yeah. To be one of those uh, people living there, many of them farmers, many of them, um, you know, people that just worked in and around the Dyersville area, uh, to have this part in the film must have been a special thrill. Yeah. So the way uh, all those folks are represented in the exhibit. Um, and then we have this. This is, you know, a very basic item, but this is integral to the story. Uh, an actual piece of corn from Dyersville. Um, how exactly did this make it to the Hall of Fame? And I also want to ask a follow-up. Does this pose special difficulties in terms of preservation? Uh, well, to answer the first part, uh, this piece of corn uh, was plucked from the outfield fence of the uh, Field of Dreams site, as it were. Uh, it was not part of the original crop that was grown for the movie. This was... Uh, um, actually, I think in 94, uh, someone went to visit the site and actually plucked a ear of corn and uh, since then donated it to the hall. Uh, so that's how we came by it. As for preservation needs, it's a dried out piece of corn. Uh, you know, dry corn has been decor. You know, you can even buy that, you know, as, you know, for autumn wreaths, things like that. But uh, so really the bottom line is that it's delicate because it is dry. Um, and that we do do uh, uh, make sure there's no uh, pe pests. We, we do constant checks for that um, because it is foodstuffs. You know, anytime you keep anything food related in a museum collection, you are inviting bugs and other vermin in. So we just have to do our due diligence behind the scenes to make sure when it's in storage that it's not being eaten. <laughs> yeah. The kernels of corn that are visible look like they're in good shape. Yeah, yeah, it's a really, for that it's almost 20 years old, it's not bad looking. <laughs> I'm trying to think of any other food items that we have in our collection. Nothing. I don't think we have anything. I think uh, we've had like chocolate bar wrappers from the Ken Griffey bar, but all that chocolate is was removed before accessioning the wrapper. Um, the closest thing would be uh, there's a piece of gum up in uh, Shoebox Treasures uh, from that was incorporated with baseball cards. Um, so I think we, we do have a piece up there in the in that exhibit. And that's just basically, you know, pink stick of hard used to be gum. <laughs> yeah. Now corn is 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 a very important in this film because Ray is a farmer. Yep. And this is the main crop that he produces. And as Dwyer Brown told us a week ago, the corn was actually an issue because when they initially went to film the corn was not that high. It, it yeah. didn't create the proper backdrop. So this yeah, they had to they had to wait. A lot of filming schedule schedules were uh, very much based on how high the corn was, and they needed it, uh, especially for the um, the voice scene when Ray first hears the voice. They needed it to be at least his height, uh, okay. uh, Kevin Costner's height, which is I believe six one. Um, and actually, at that point, for that that particular scene that they filmed, he. The article I read said that they actually had to build a, it grew so high that they had to build a special platform for him to walk on. So it's about not so high above his head. Um, but yeah, I also read that in August when they were filming, there was also a drought. And so that also affected the corn and affected the grass for the field. And so they actually would also paint uh, some of the set to make sure that everything still looked green. Yeah. It all ties together. It's it does. Really, it does. Really a great story. Now we also have an item that came out after the film uh, mm -hmm. was released, after it became a hit. Uh, we describe this as a commemorative bat. But tell us the backstory to this. Yep. Yeah, so this is uh, just one of those uh, little trophy bats, you know, about 18 inches long or so, 
Um, and when, after filming wrapped, like I said earlier, Becky and Don kept the field uh, and kept the site uh, as the, it became a Field of Dreams tourist site for people to come and uh, play catch on where, where uh, Ray Kinsella had his catch with his dad. So tons of families would come and do that. Um, to my understanding, the, there was free admission to the site, but to help uh, offset the cost of the care, they opened up a souvenir shop. And so souvenirs like this bat were sold at the site. Mm. Um, I, I would guess that something like that still happens. Um, and uh, so, yeah, this is one of the souvenirs. This is not from Becky and Don. This is from a separate donor uh, that we just, we of course accepted it because we thought it was a very cool tie and knowing that we had this exhibit coming up would be awesome to have. Is the Field of Dreams site currently open to the public given our, our current health situation? It is. According to the website, it is. Yeah. Um, I think there's, because it's an outdoor space, I think there's less of a problem than it being an indoor space. Now, as Gabrielle mentioned earlier, this year's game that was scheduled to take place, the Major League game between the White Sox and Cardinals, uh, has been postponed, but they are planning to play it sometime next year, either July or August. It'll be a regular season game. It'll be part of the 2021 schedule. Um, Gabrielle, I want to get kind of uh, some overall thoughts uh, in terms of themes. And we talked about this the other day with Tom Schieber in our Ask the Expert uh, series. And he mentioned the importance of developing thesis points, exploring two or three broad themes, messages that you hope some or lots of visitors will be able to garner from a particular exhibit. For people who come to see this exhibit, it's going to be open uh, for a while. What do you hope that they'll draw from it in terms of a theme, in terms of a message? Um, well, when, I, when we first started brainstorming and thinking about what this exhibit was going to look like, it really boiled down to two points. It really boiled down to what is the history behind the film and, you know, the creation of the film. So, you know, talking that, that covers the, you know, uh, with the, the real baseball characters of Moonlight Graham and Shoeless Joe Jackson, but also talking about what was the inspiration for the film. So, you know, talking about W.P. Kinsella's original Shoeless Joe novel. Um, but then on the flip side, we also, it, this is, you know, 31 years later after this movie came out, it's still a mainstay and part of American popular culture. And so exploring how that has happened um, and, ha and why it, it, it's, it resonates with fans. Um, and so that's, and even if, again, even if people haven't seen it, they know the quotes, you know, uh, if you build it, he will come as been listed on America, the American Film Institute's top 100 quote list. I believe it's number 39, which is pretty high up there. Yeah. Uh, that people just know what that quote is, even if they haven't seen the movie. Um, so those are the two main points. It's like it's a, a pre new appreciation of the film uh, and what went into it and what came out of it, and then also how it's how it's ever become an everlasting part of it, uh, our culture. Folks, we want to take your questions for Gabrielle about this new exhibit just opening today here at the Hall of Fame. It is called Is This Heaven? Our new exhibit about the film Field of Dreams. And if you would like to pose your question, you can do so in the Zoom group chat. We talked earlier about how you can access that. There's a menu bar either at the top or bottom of your screen. You'll see the three dots and the more. Under that, you'll see the word chat. Press on that and you can uh, pose your question to Gabrielle about our newest exhibit. By the way, it is actually one of two new exhibits here at the Hall of Fame. Uh, the other one that is just now open to the public as well is something that we do every year. It's our new inductee case, cases as the case may be. Uh, we have, of course, four new inductees or electees this year. They were supposed to have been inducted back in July. That could not have happened this year because of the pandemic situation. So their induction will be delayed until next year. But if you come out, you will see exhibit cases for Derek Jeter, uh, Larry Walker, Ted Simmons, and the late Marvin Miller. And they are all located up on the third floor of the Hall of Fame and Museum. So that is another exhibit uh, that you can check out. So it's a busy time here. We've been reopened since June 26th. And now we have these two uh, wonderful new exhibits uh, to provide some additional entertainment. Uh, let's, um, let's go to a question that we have uh, coming in from Jim. 
uh, Jim, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name because I know that I will butcher it. So I'll just say Jim. Uh, he wants to know, how did the Lansing property get selected as the site of the movie? Thoughts on that, Gabrielle? Uh, great question. I was I don't have the brains and behind the scenes knowledge of the producers that chose it, but I believe it was they they were just uh, they wanted to film in Iowa um, and they found the perfect, I think, I'm guessing it all fit in that they had the perfect farmhouse that they were looking for with the corn very located very closely to make it all work. Um, I don't know the specifics behind that. That would probably would have been a better question for Becky and Don if they had been able to join us. Yeah. And there was no field originally. It was just a farm, right? Yep. It was just a farm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have another question coming in from Terry. I believe it's Terry Vasquez. Uh, Gabrielle, since you have seen the film many times, at which scene, if any, uh, do you cry every time? <laughs> um, I don't cry. It takes <laughs> a lot for me to cry during a movie. Uh, so that's probably the wrong answer. Um, there's, there's a couple of touching moments, um, but there's also really a couple of really, I find, humorous moments. I think uh, one of my favorite uh, other pop culture reference within the movie is uh, when the White Sox players disappear back into the corn for the first time. One of them says, I'm melting like the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, and that gets me every time because obviously if there were 1919 White Sox players, it was before Wizard of Oz was made in 1939. So to me, that's a fun little aside that I really enjoy. Um, but I do, uh, I do appreciate the, uh, the, the father-son catch um, as my dad and I have played catch many a times. Uh, and still do to this day, that that does resonate with me. All right, very good. A couple of uh, interesting moments, comedic and uh, poignant as well. I guess for me that, you know, that penultimate scene uh, just before the parade of cars, uh, that whole exchange between Kevin Costner and Dwyer Brown, uh, Ray Kinsella, the son, talking to his father, who is now much younger than him because mm -hmm. he's come back in time. Um, it really, for me, it works. And yeah, um, yeah there's uh, some sentimentality there. Some might criticize it as sappy. I would not go that far. Um, but I think there's also uh, some realism. And I think a lot of fathers and sons, fathers and daughters can, uh, can resonate. Uh, yeah. with what happened there. So that I is also really love uh, even, even the scene right before that with uh, James Earl Jones's monologue. The monologue's fabulous. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Matthew. Um, I don't know if Gabrielle knows the answer. I know I don't, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, who provided the voice uh, in the film? Uh, this, by the way, is from Matthew. Uh, who provided the voice? I've heard it said it was Ed Harris, who in real life, Amy Madigan's husband. Do you know about that, Gabrielle? Um, it is still a mystery to this day. Yes, I've read that rumor that it is Ed Harris, but there to to this day has not been confirmed nor denied uh yeah. and in the film it's it's credited as himself <laughs> the voice is credited as himself in the film in the credit scene i guess uh, the director would be the only one who knows for sure right right and yes no one's no one spilled the beans on that one which is pretty cool yeah um as we get set to wrap up our program about our new exhibit is this heaven uh this is a temporary exhibit so it's not a permanent exhibit that we'll have here for 15 or 20 years. Do we have a sense, Gabrielle, of just how long it might be up? Do you think it'll be up through next year's Field of Dreams game? What do you think? I think, I think at this point that is now definitely the goal since that game has been uh, postponed. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see what's coming down the pike for us as a, in our curatorial department. So once again, the exhibit is called Is This Heaven? It is about the 1989 film Field of Dreams. Uh, when you come to the Hall of Fame, and we hope you come here this weekend or sometime in the near future, if you go past the plaque gallery, take the ramp up to the library. Uh, just before you get to the library, um, you'll actually you'll see some stanchions because we've closed off the library per se uh, from the public at this point for health reasons. But just before that cutoff, you then turn to the right and you will see the exhibit, uh, Is This Heaven? And it is just outside of our baseball at the movies exhibit. That one, by the way, is 
a permanent exhibit. So is the seven will be up at least through uh, next summer, uh, possibly a little bit longer. We'll have to uh, wait and see in terms of uh, an exact finishing date. So that one of our two new exhibits here at the Baseball Hall of Fame, the other one featuring our class of 2020. Uh, Gabrielle, uh, third time for us. Uh, as always, it's been fun. We really do Absolutely. appreciate your insights. Thanks. Oh, no, thank you for having me. It's always fun. Again, uh, our guest has been uh, Gabrielle Augustine, uh, one of the curators here at the Baseball Hall of Fame and the lead curator uh, on our new exhibit about the movie Field of Dreams. One of the things we also want to ask folks to do is to uh, think about giving us support if you enjoyed this program, if you've enjoyed some of our previous program. We'd like you to think about becoming a member of the Friends of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, to do that, just go to our website, which is baseballhall.org, baseballhall.org, and then go to the tab for membership. You can learn how to become a member. There's all different sorts of levels. There's uh, single memberships, family memberships, junior memberships for the younger fans out there, uh, and then they work their way all the way up to uh, – uh, higher levels, whatever you're able to afford, whatever you can contribute as a supporter, as a member of the Hall of Fame, we'll certainly appreciate it. And that's the kind of thing that allows us to do these sorts of programs. So again, go to baseballhall.org and then click onto the membership tab. We hope you've enjoyed our virtual curator spotlight. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks.